This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. My name is Kit, and I'm in my third year of Birkbeck. I'm doing uh, Zola, uh, myth in Zola specifically, which I find really interesting because um, most people see Zola as a naturalist writer. So um, he, he talks about things that you can see and touch and measure, but myth is um, not naturalism. So, so that's what I find very interesting. Um, I gave this paper um, a couple of weeks ago um, at the Zola Society for a general audience. So um, the uh, quotations that I give will be in English. Um, but if, I, if anyone wants to know what the French is, I'll try and remember what the French is. Uh, and it's also for a very general audience. So. Um, that's probably not such a bad thing because I think uh, a few people haven't read much Zola, so I think um, that's that's fine. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Right, and um, this is called Regeneration from Death to Life in the Rugon Car. And the Rugon Car is um, it's a series of 20 novels portraying the life and times of the French Second Empire period from 1851 to 1870. The books depict these 19 years under the rule of Napoleon III as a time of corruption and great financial excess. There was much hardship for the have-nots and underprivileged, and extraordinary wealth and power for others, as shown in Zola's novels. The specific experience of women in the novels is very interesting, and from the first to the 20th novel, it follows a movement from death to life. Zola gave his series the subtitle Natural and Social History of a Family Under the Second Empire. As a self-professed naturalist writer, Zola tried to depict his characters from a physiological point of view so that their physical appetites accounted for their desires and motivations. It also means that the physical body of the characters plays an unusually important part in the story. We find that Zola expresses the social and political conditions of the time through the bodies, and this is especially the case for some of his women characters. Zola is often accused of being a miserableist and pessimist, but we shall see that these female characters show the author to be a grand optimist. The desperation of living in the Second Empire is transformed from tragedy into faith in the human condition. And I will focus on five novels in which the female characters display this general movement from death to life. The first is The Fortune of the Rugons, in which the family matriarch, Tom Deed, first appears. It is in Tom Deed's body that a biological weakness, which Sola calls the folieur, or the flaw, is established. This flaw then runs as a physiological scene through some of her family members, a total of five generations who are affected by it. The flaw comes out as destructively negative traits in individuals such as alcoholism, homicidal tendencies, and greed for power. The second novel is The Lady's Paradise, set inside a vast department store in which women seem to have no willpower against the objects for sale, which they feel they must buy in vast quantities. Zola shows the store manager whipping up a fever in the women, which the reader is to take as a literal bodily illness. The third novel, The Kill, depicts the vice and evil of René as the consequence of living in a luxurious environment which has been built on her husband's ill-gotten gains. There is optimism in the character of Albine in the fourth novel, The Sin of Father Mouret, who is portrayed as a pure child of nature. This theme is then carried through to the fifth novel, Dr. Pascal, where we meet Clotilde, who is representative of the life-giving mother. This is also the 20th and final instalment of the Rougon Car, and the series ends on a high note of life triumphing over death. The first Rougon Car novel is The Fortune of the Rougons, where the family matriarch Tom Deed is first introduced. 
She is the mother of Pierre Rougon, her legitimate son, but also to the illegitimate Antoine Macquart. At the time of Napoleon III's political coup in 1851, Pierre and Antoine, on opposing political sides, strike a bargain, which allows Pierre to gain social and political advantage in the provincial town of Plasson. Antoine agrees to be paid a sum of money to effectively betray his political side, which also results in some deaths. The money that Antoine receives then becomes blood money. There is a close link between blood, the body, and the money, which runs throughout the Rougon car, and it seems to be established in the deal between Pierre and Antoine. The murderous nature of their pact is reflected when Pierre and his wife, after coming up with the plan, go to bed and there is a spot of light like an eye on their bedroom ceiling fixed on the sleeping couple. They dream of a shower of blood in their bedroom where the large drops changed into pieces of gold on the floor. When Pierre pays 800 francs to Macar in Tom Deed's house, her family is not sure what the, what the seemingly insane matriarch is referring to when she shouts, the price of blood, I heard the gold, assassins, their wolves. In view of the subsequent physiological flaw, which becomes established in the family, Deed's next comment is prescient. She shouts, the accursed, they have stolen, they have killed, and they live like gentlemen. At this point, Dr. Pascal, Deed's third son, believes he sees the future of the family as a riot of unleashed and sated appetites in a flash of gold and blood. Pascal's premonition proves correct, and the other Rougon carnivals document the social damage caused by the appetites of family members, some of whom reach powerful social positions. This is a typical analysis by Pascal, whose great interest is in heredity, and he sees his family as objects of research in his naturalist project. Pascal has drawn up a family tree in which he documents the physiological curiosities of each family member, and it is a literal and metaphorical tree where Tom Deed is the stump from which there are different branches and the sap carries along the same seeds to the furthest stalks. The unholy alliance between the body and money is also explored in the department store novel, The Lady's Paradise. Octave Mouret is the owner of the luxury store and it is his ambition to make as much money as possible from his female customers. His technique is to seduce his customers into buying his products but we shall see that the whole sales operation is on a much more sinister level. Above the store entrance, there are two allegor allegorical figures, two laughing women with their heads thrown back, displaying their bare throats. The customer's first encounter in entering the store would be to walk under these two figures, who would seem not to be in control of themselves. It is a deliberate sales strategy to make the female customers slightly deranged. So we could view the two allegorical figures, as Zola terms them, as unnervingly appropriate in regard to the store's intention. Murray, the manager, admits that he wants to conquer women, intoxicate her with gallant attention and traffic in her desires and exploit her fever. At first, the female customer might believe that the store exists to flatter her. There are displays of stockings which show the rounded profiles of the calf. The insistence on the individual female body part continues with another display, this time of silk scarves folded as if going round a curved waist. The mannequins show an idealised woman with strong hips exaggerating a fine waist. However, the individual part becomes a fragmentation and denaturing of the female form, where the mannequin's head is replaced by a price label. Mirrors in the shop multiply these women for sale, who carry prices in large lettering in place of their heads. 
the department store is a capitalist machine, and Zola describes it as a machine which roared, releasing its steam with a rumble. This description is very close to that of the mine in another novel, Journey Lamb, which ingests its mine workers on a daily basis, part machine and part animal. Mure is seen as the inventor of this machine for eating women, and his fortune transformed Paris because it was made of the flesh and blood of women. Mure's desire to exploit the fever of the women to shop is extended to the description of the white sail, which is constructed as a place of heavenly purity in its sale of white-coloured products. However, this belies the intended sales reality. The customer activity is seen as a fever, but this is really an induced sickness. The customers come out of the shopping experience as stripped, violated, half undone. Mure's view of his female customers as dehumanised is made clear in the many descriptions of the mirrors showing parts of faces, shoulders and arms, and the crowd is no more than human dust. The rebuilding of the modern Paris in which Mure's department store is able to thrive is portrayed in the novel The Kill. To fund the construction, Baron Houseman <coughs> Napoleon III's prefect of the same borrowed millions of francs in four separate tranches. The amount doubled each time from 60 million in 1855 to 400 million in 1869, making a total of 830 million francs within the space of 14 years. One character in the, in the novel, Tutan Laroche, describes the results as superb and that it remains one of the best financial operations of the era. Aristide Saccar replies that Paris has become the capital of the world. Yet another character declares that he cannot believe that he, an old Parisian, no longer recognises his old Paris, before admitting he got lost the other day, walking in the city. The arch-speculator Aristide Saccar makes his fortune in the kill. He is initially Aristide Rougon before changing his surname to Saccar to help his progress in the new capitalism of the Second Empire. He is later to be seen creating his bank in the novel of Money, which ends with disastrous financial results. Aristide arrives in Paris just as the Second Empire is proclaimed after Napoleon III's coup d'etat. Zola is sarcastic when he writes about Paris at that time. Now that a strong government protected it and removed the effort of thinking and settling its own affairs, the great preoccupation was to know which amusements would best kill time. He becomes scathing about the political reality of the coup d'etat. For this handful of adventurers who had just stolen the throne, they would set in train shady deals sold consciences, bought women, furious and universal drunkenness. And in the city where the blood of December had hardly been washed away. So it is that Aristide is able to start his speculating career in the selling of land and buildings, the practice of which Zola describes as lighting the blaze of luxury in the extreme. The fever that grips the women in Mouret's department store is part of a wider intoxication which grips the new capitalism of the Second Empire. On Aristide's arrival in Paris from the provinces, he is desperate to roam the streets where he counted on making millions burst out from the burning pavements. Aristide is not immune from the capitalist fever, as Zola describes his emotion as that of a gambler putting his burning hands on the green bays. Zola describes the Parisian air going to Aristide's head, but this then turns into a moral comment when Aristide is described as a man who walks in evil. The extent of the evil is transposed into a hunting image for Aristide. The light smells which came to him assured him that he was on the right track, that prey ran before him that the great imperial chase, 
the chase for adventures, for women, for millions, was starting at last. Aristide feels he has been let loose in the fray, permitting him to bleed people dry, but legally. In the original French, Zola uses the verb égorger, which has two meanings, to cut the throat off, and secondly, to bleed dry in the financial sense. Both these meanings are equally applicable to Aristide's behaviour because he makes underhand deals for financial gain and his intense practices bordering on the psychopathic are not too far removed from the hunting image of death by killing. The nexus of blood, the body, death and money encapsulated by the kill's very title is made clear when Aristide takes his first wife to the heights of Montmartre, where they have a bird's eye view of Paris below them. He tells her of his plans to reconstruct Paris, the whole of which is spread out before them as he speaks. Zola describes Aristide's hand stretched out, open and scything like a cutlass, as if separating the city into four parts. In its regeneration, Paris becomes the prey, as it is described as being chopped by slashes of the sword, the veins open, feeding 100,000 levies and builders, puncturing Paris from one end to the other, breaking beams, crushing stones, leaving behind long and hideous injuries of collapsing walls. The speculating deals and subsequent rebuilding of Paris is like the most violent assault on the body. As Aristide's ambition grows, he marries a second time, and it is a marriage of convenience for both parties, as Aristide is able to access large amounts of money, and Renée's reputation is saved. The couple live in immense opulence, and the exterior of their house is uncannily like that of Murray's department store. Just as the store has two carved figures of women, seemingly not in control of themselves above the entrance. The exterior of Renée's home disappears under its, under its sculptures, some of which are of nude women, hips extended, bosoms pushed forward, playing with apples, striking a pose. The carved figures of the store represent the fever suffered by the women shoppers. The same group of women suffering under the commercial imperative is replicated with the sculptures on Renée's house. Indeed, Zola makes a direct allusion in his description of the windows of the house, so wide and clear that they seemed like the windows of modern department stores put there to display the sumptuous interior to the outside. Renée's status as a woman in the novel means that she is bought and sold like a commodity. In the negotiations for her hand in marriage, you find out that Renée's price is 100,000 francs. Zola terms this as the sacrifice, which on one hand may be taken in the conventional sense as a loss, or in French it can mean to give away merchandise for a knockdown price. We are told that Renée, since the negotiation of her marriage, had regained her scattered-brained nature and her madness, just like the illness suffered by the female shoppers in the department store, Zola writes that Renée's role as Aristide's wife made her poor head become a little unhinged with each passing day. The sculptures of the new women playing with apples on Renée's house are emblematic of the commercial pressure which grips women, but they are also reminiscent of the figure of the biblical Eve in the Garden of Eden eating fruits from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For Christianity, it is this act which instigates the perpetuation of original sin for humanity. Therefore, the image of the sculptures playing with apples suggests the fall from grace and the shift towards evil. As well as highlighting the destructive relationship between commerce and women, Zola also understands the moral aspect of this. Renée comes from an old, respected, moneyed family, and her marriage to Aristide plunges her into the new world of risky high finance and speculation. She 
feels shame and dirtied by her husband's activities. And she promises to find some innocent amusement to distract her, as she did in her childhood. Innocent is the crucial word, because it means free of evil, something which her husband's speculating activities are certainly not. However, it seems that René cannot break free from this environment of evil. In a conversation with her stepson, Maxine, he describes her luxurious lifestyle and is incredulous that she is still bored. He acknowledges that there is no pleasure that she has not experienced and declares, I would say that you have bitten into all the apples. There is, of course, one more apple still to be bitten into by René, and it is the affair she has with her stepson. The leading up to her commitment to such an evil is paralleled by a weakening of her mental and moral capacities. On the evening of the beginning of her downfall, René is in the conservatory. It is the boiling sap of the plants, loaded with drunkenness, which brings on her own intoxication. So the writes that it is the strong fragrances which break her perfumes that are interwoven with stinking odours loaded with poison. In this heavy atmosphere, Renée's good intentions disappear, and the drunkenness from dinner, redoubled by the surrounding drunken sap, break her resolve to remain innocent. In the conservatory, we witness Renée's decision to start an incestuous relationship with her stepson, her biting into the apple, so he describes it as an unknown pleasure, hot with crime. There is a particular Madagascan plant in the conservatory, dubbed a cursed plant by Zola, and Renee bites one of the leaves, having lost her mind. Zola uses the word esprit to denote that Renee has lost her reason, but in French it also means spirit, so the reader can also take it that her soul has been lost. Right, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to skip um, towards the end. I'm going to um, skip one of the novels, um, Dr. Pascal. Um, um, when I do talk about Dr. Pascal, I talk about the Fourier um, from the first novel, that's where um, the Fourier is established. And in the 20th novel, the last of the book on the car, um, that's where um, the fluor, which is, um, it resides in the blood, um, in the bloodline of the family, the five generations, that's where it disappears um, in the 20th um, novel of Dr. Pascal, because one of the um, family members um, has hemorrhage and dies, so the fluor just slips away, um, but it's still left quite ambiguous as to whether um, that really is the end of the film. Um, so the uh, conclusion. Um, from the deathly Tom Deed presented in the first novel of the series, whose body is a symbol of death and destruction for the Rugal Makar family, we have moved to the denatured and fragmented minds and bodies of the female customers of Octave Murray's department store. The moral consequence of capitalism becomes clear in Renee's case, whereby vice and evil emerge as part of financial corruption. Zola's belief in life is then shown in the bodies of Desiree and Albine, both children of nature, who channel the sap of the earth into their own bodies. Clotilde is the final life giver of the series in, the, in Dr. Pascal, her son incarnating the hope of the Rugon Car family and for humanity itself. As life is actually the last word in Dr. Pascal, so the optimist has allowed life the final word on his